Brian Smith here, and welcome to the Dream Path Podcast, where I try to get inside the heads of talented creatives from all over the world. My goal is to demystify and humanize the creative process and make it accessible to everyone. Now let's jump in. Jason Moore, welcome to the Duocast. I'm glad to be here, Brian. Thank you. So we're here to talk about two episodes. We have a Keith Thomas bonus episode. Yeah. And also the Moose Cat Studios 100th episode. Right on. So what do you want to talk about first? Well, let's, uh, let's talk about Keith. Okay, let's go chronological. Keith Thomas. I really enjoyed that interview, actually, with Keith. Um, you know, the guy like wears several hats in the film business. You know, he's a producer, he's a director and screenwriter, and very good at doing all of them. And even though I've yet to see the movie The Vigil, and I haven't really watched Arcane, those are still kind of in my, my plans. Uh, but I did watch the trailer of The Vigil, and I could tell it's uh, very well made. I'm not really into horror movies as much as I used to. I mean, when I was younger, I would watch horror movies. Most of the horror stuff I would watch was stuff like, you know, the Friday the 13th movies or the Freddy Krueger movies, which were, you know, basically kind of cheesy and predictable. And uh, like you, for whatever reason, my parents let me watch The Exorcist when I was like 10 or 11. And it kind of ruined it for, you know, other horror films. I mean, I couldn't sleep the night I saw that one. Yeah, I've lost many a night's sleep from the exorcist the uh, intrusive horrific memories of seeing that film and seeing linda blair spinning her head around and vomiting oh. all over the room <laughs> i still oh. am traumatized from that memory you know the the memory from that movie that really freaked me out was her backwards crab walking down the stairs <laughs> that's another freaky image isn't it yeah oh just the image of that and then when they were trying to figure out what she was saying and they were had they figured out if you played the tape backwards that you could understand it in English. That freaked me out. So, I mean, there's so many aspects to that movie that just, it's, it's traumatizing. When you're that young and you see something like that, you're like, why am I watching this? Yeah. Thanks a lot, mom and dad. <laughs> yeah. It was interesting to hear Keith Thomas talk about that movie as being one of his influences. Right. And how he kind of comes from my generation uh, I'm not sure how old he is, but he seemed like he was about my age, uh, maybe a little bit younger. Yeah. And it was neat to hear about his journey because he started off not going to film school, but kind of jumping right into screenwriting from a completely different career, which was medical research. Right. And how he used his experience in medical research to fuel ideas for screenplays, specifically experience working with older people who have been the subjects of his two films, Arcane, the short film, which is on YouTube, and The Vigil, which is now streaming on all platforms. But he takes the older antagonist, protagonist character and uses that as a launching pad for a very interesting character that can go anywhere because of their situation. They're either demented or kind of in the tail end of their life and are a little bit unpredictable. And we talked about that on the show, how young children, like in the Firestarter movie that he's going to remake, which is Stephen King's film from the early 80s, how that uses a child protagonist and also the vigil, which has an elderly protagonist, that those two extremes make for really interesting content and narrative devices in horror movies. Yeah, I agree. I really want to watch it and I'm going to really try to find the time to uh, watch the vigil. Yeah, well, one of the advantages I have building up to these interviews is that I get screeners for all of these, and I have to do the research. Otherwise, the interview is not going to work out if I haven't seen the films. So I do a deep dive on all of these guests before I talk to them, and you don't have to do that. You just have to edit the episode and make sure it sounds good. Right. But I definitely recommend seeing The Vigil because it's part of a subgenre of films that I call minimalist horror. And I love minimalist horror because it's very contained. There's very few settings, very few characters. And so it's cheap to make, but still you, you don't sacrifice quality just because there are less locations and less characters or a lower budget. You still have a very powerful, impactful horror movie. And I love doing a lot with very little. I love that concept in the arts. Yeah, for sure. Are you pretty excited about what he's going to do with Firestarter? 
and the uh, adaptation for that. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I'm hoping that we can talk to him again once that Firestarter movie is in the can and ready to distribute. I'd love to help promote it and get the word out because Stephen King films, for me, you know, I've grown up on Stephen King films, whether it's Carrie or Cujo Mm -hmm. or It, the It series. And now my kids are watching the It series and, you know, the remakes. And Stephen King is just one of these iconic horror writers and creators that really has done well in the movie business because his books are so cinematic. They translate very easily into cinema. Yeah. Um, and I'd love to talk to Keith about it. And it's, it's neat to see how a filmmaker can go from making a short film like Arcane, seven or eight minutes long, putting it up on YouTube. And based on that, based upon how well that's received, if you look at how many views it has, it's like 350 views. Wow. 350 views, but it gets exposure through that production and starts to have street cred. And that's how he's able to make The Vigil. And he makes this little indie film, The Vigil. And based upon the success of The Vigil, has Stephen King see the film. And then Stephen King blesses him to work on the remake of Firestarter. And what a success story to go from a short film like Arcane to a little indie flick like The Vigil to a big studio Blumhouse Media horror film like Firestarter. It's incredible. Yeah, it is. I hope we do get a chance to talk to him after that. Yeah, it's those relationships that keep going after the podcast that I really appreciate and uh, don't take for granted. Because as I mentioned before, every time an episode launches, uh, I don't consider that relationship to be over. It's just sort of the beginning with the guests, what we do together. And the way that we reconnect with guests down the road, I think, is pretty special. Yeah, I agree. So the next interview we have to recap is the Moose Cat Recording Studio interview. What'd you think of that one? Well, I loved it. I mean, that's, you know, first of all, it's our 100th episode. Secondly, it's about recording studios. And that's basically where I'm sitting now is in a, you know, our little, my little recording studio where I do all the work and everything. And just listening to, you know, them talk about the setting that they have, the equipment that they have. I looked at their website. They're using mostly tube and analog type equipment, um, reel-to-reel tape machine. Um, They're taking digital recordings, running it through analog equipment onto tape and back to the computer. At least that's what I I, I get the impression that they kind of do it that way to kind of warm up the sound. Because as you know, you know, recording digitally, it's so clear and so perfect. And there's just, you, you lose a little bit of the sort of the essence of old style recording and old style sound, which was very rich and very uh, warm sounding and went well on vinyl. And that's kind of a thing today too, people putting all their stuff on cassette and vinyl again. So I just, I loved hearing about the process and Mike Post talking about the differences between engineering and producing. And he's both I mean, he's kind of a jack of all trades when it comes to all that stuff, because he could be, you know, with his band, he could be with another artist. He can play guitar with, you know, fill in for anybody. He's basically a studio musician and a producer and an engineer. And, uh, you know, I think it's helped both of them out as far as both of their musical careers. Carly and the uh, Universe and his band, The Young Creatures, I think. I think we're going to hear quite a bit more from both of them in the years to come. They're just getting started. Yeah, one thing I'm trying to do with the podcast in 2021 is expand beyond the filmmaker and musician guest into folks that are actually making it happen behind the scenes. Right. I know I did that a little bit in 2020 when I talked to production designers in film or cinematographers, people that are behind the camera. But here with Carly and Mike, we actually spoke to folks who were behind the mic, the people that are in charge of making the magic happen within the recording studio. Yeah. And it's a world that I know very little about that you are actually way more qualified than I to chat with these guests about because you know so much about recording. But that's what makes it fun for me is I treat this as a way to find out about an industry that I know very little about. And I hope that my listeners appreciate that inquiry as well. And it it was a special affinity I have for recording studio folks because I have very fond memories from my college days of recording in my band, Uncle Squirrely, in a recording studio for the first time and seeing how that works and how that's put together. And at the time, and still to this day, to some degree, it's very foreign to me. How does this work? How does this 
microphone differ from that microphone? And what about that amp? And uh, a solid state amp versus a tube amp or this board versus that board. Right. I'm glad that there's people like you, Mike and Carly, who have it all figured out because that way artists can just go in, plug and play and trust that it's going to sound fantastic. Well, yeah. And I liked what he said too about recording it all inclusive, you know, as a band, like going in and plugging everything in and doing it live rather than doing it one by one, which is what a lot of bands fall back onto later on to kind of make a more perfect record. You know, you have your drummer come in or the drummer and bass player come in and do all the rhythm tracks and then the guitar players come in and do their parts and then they put the leads on and then the vocals the next day. And it's a big, long process, but you make a really perfect record. And what Mike was talking about is that sort of imperfection and that sort of, you know, kind of off the cuff, just everybody together in the same room, catching a vibe, catching a groove and putting it down that way live. And that's, Mm -hmm. that's how they did it in the old days. You know, I mean, that's how I did it with Uncle Squirrely. That's, that's how I did it when I, when, when I was with Anajaron, we used a eight track Fostex reel to reel tape recorder. I still have the master for it. And, um, that's how, you know, you know, Frank Sinatra used to sit there with the orchestra and record right there. One take. So that's, I like that. I like that concept of being able to go in and do it old school, make it sound really good. I'm, I'm glad Mike and Carly are keeping that tradition going. Me too. So what have you been up to lately besides editing these podcasts? Oh, you know, <laughs> I have been doing some stuff around the house and I actually, um, I, I think I told you I picked up a Tascam recording machine, a digital recording machine. And for my listeners that don't know what a Tascam is or a digital recording machine is, what is it? Okay. So it's an enclosed unit. It's an eight track digital recorder and it uses an SD card to capture all of the information that you're recording into it. You plug into it and you can export drum tracks from your computer into it and start putting down tracks. And I'm going to use it to track guitars because I don't have a very good computer to do all that really high tech stuff on because it, it does take a little bit of, um, you, you know, you can't have any latency when you're doing that kind of stuff or it just doesn't work. So I bought this little unit. It was on sale. It's a Tascam DP-03SD. If anybody wants to go check one out, it's a pretty neat little unit. I, uh, I've yet to really fully dive into it. There's a bit of a learning curve with it because, well, it's got its own kind of operating system inside and you get a, and the manual is like almost 80 pages. So, you know, a little bit of learning curve on that. But my goal is to track guitars for some songs that I've been working on over the last few years and finally get them done. Right on. I can't wait to hear that music, man. You got to send it my way. I will. I just I just started messing with it the other day and I got it to where I, I can do it without any problems. And so my goal is to incorporate the positive grid as well. I had to order a cable for that. So we'll see what happens. Ah, the positive grid. You and I have talked favorably about the positive grid amp for quite a while now. Oh yeah, it's been it's been over a year. Yeah, I haven't been able to use that as much as I'd like to, but it's a fun little unit. Oh, it's it's awesome. I love it. Well, uh, I haven't been doing much recording lately. I have been continuing with my voice lessons. Oh, good. But I have not been able to use my recording equipment to record music as much as I'd like to. One of these days when the pandemic settles down, we need to get together in person so you can kind of show me the ropes and I can start using this equipment to record more music. I would actually love to do that. That would be fun. One thing I have been doing lately, though, is watching a lot of movies because... It's that time of year when publicists are sending me lots of movies to watch to prepare for interviews, so I've been doing that. And I've also been watching movies with my family on the side that have nothing to do with work or the podcast. One of those films I've seen, I wanted to give a shout out to, it's a little indie film. It's called I Blame Society. It is written and directed by Jillian Wallace Hormaker, and she is wonderfully talented. She wrote this movie It's basically a serial killer movie, and she's the star, and I'm not going to say too much about it. You can go out and watch the trailer if you want. I'm not a big fan of movie trailers (laughs) these days. I think they tell too much of the story. I like movie trailers. Yeah, for me, I mean, movie trailers are entertaining, but they reveal too much about the story from start to finish for my taste. Right. Once I see a trailer that I know I want to see the movie for, I stop watching it. And I did that with I Blame Society because I knew I wanted to see this 
from start to finish with as few expectations as possible. And that's just my way of watching movies. When I go to Sundance, I don't like to know much about it. Same thing with any film festival experience. I don't like to know much about the cast or the crew or the the plot. I just want to go in kind of tabula rasa. And that's what I did with I Believe Society. It's a fun little film. It's a satirical serial killer movie that um, it's kind of gruesome, but it also is comedic and fun, if that sounds possible. I know it doesn't sound possible, but <laughs> it is. And uh, I think we're going to be seeing a lot more from Jillian down the road. Talented filmmaker. Can't wait to see that trailer, actually. <laughs> Check it out, man. And uh, one more piece of news before we talk about the upcoming guest, what to expect next. Okay. I received an email this week, a very exciting email. I have been invited to attend the South by Southwest Film, Music, and Comedy Festival as a member of the press. Right on, Brian. That's good news. Yeah, so I've never been. I've never been to Austin, Texas. I've never participated in South by Southwest to see movies or comedy or music. But now because the festival is online, I have press credentials to be able to participate. And I am really looking forward to talking to creatives that have projects in that festival. Yeah, that sounds very exciting. I'm proud of you, man. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, I actually thought March was going to be kind of a breather for us. <laughs> no rest for the wicked, man. There is not. <laughs> No rest for the wicked indeed, my friend. <laughs> so what do we have coming up next, Jason? Uh, we have an interview with uh, Welsh fashion artist, Nikki Pilkington. That was a great chat. Nikki is someone that I've been wanting to talk to for a long time, since I started the podcast, actually. Yeah. I have a friend named Max Flower that you know. I do. And he lives in Marina del Rey in Southern California on the beach. And he met Nikki on the streets of Los Angeles and told me about her and actually told her about me. And this was right after I started the podcast in 2019. And so I went on to her website, found her email, sent her an email asking for an interview. And just recently, within the last couple of weeks, she emailed me back like a year and a half later <laughs> and said, hey, I'm just now seeing your email. Do you want to sit down for an interview? So we set that up via Zoom. She's already moved back to the United Kingdom, actually. She first moved back to Wales, and then now she's in London. So I interviewed her from her apartment in London, and we had a lovely chat about her career as an illustrator. To call her an illustrator really does not do her art justice. You have to go to her website and see what she does. She is what I would call a social media influencer. She has, I think, over 60,000 followers on Instagram. And she puts out incredible work that's singular, it's unique. She does all kinds of commercial work for big companies like Nike and Google, but she also does commissions for collectors around the world and um, has a really loyal following throughout the art community. So it was neat to be able to talk to someone like Nikki putting out work that I knew very little about. And uh, fashion illustration is kind of how she got her start. But it's way bigger than that. So looking forward to hearing how that sounds. Yeah, me too. I actually checked out some of her work on Instagram. I follow her on Instagram as well. So um, yeah, I'm actually excited to hear what she has to say. Right on, brother. Well, it's good connecting with you, man. Well, as usual, it's always, it's always great, Brian. I appreciate it. Thanks for including me. Until next time, my friend. Hey, thank you for listening. And I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If so, I have a favor to ask. Can you go to wherever you listen to podcasts and leave me a review? Your feedback is what keeps this podcast going. You can also check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook with the handle at DreamPathPod. And as always, go find your dream path.